Well, welcome back. I I hope you were well. This is the fourth of the series of um, interactions, which I began uh, a few days ago. And the theme or the question presented was, were you prepared? Were you equipped? Um, were you provided with the necessary knowledge, attitude or skills uh, needed for a successful relationship? We continue from where we stopped in the previous session. Now just to recap, in yesterday's uh, session, I, I decided to present a series of questions. There were 10 questions that I asked, which I hope if you were part of yesterday's session, you answered, but more importantly, you took some time to reflect on the answers and the questions. I will be picking up from yesterday's session with a recap. The recap is not necessarily to go through each question. The recap will be to use some words, about four or five words, which I hope will um, serve as a way of connecting you with the thought process you had yesterday. Now, if you aggregate all of the questions that I asked, I would hope that you would have started to notice um, a picture in your mind um, and some of the pictures that you would have seen would have been, hopefully, in your case, a picture of a man or a picture of several men that have played a part in your upbringing and in your life, whether that be a father, a brother, a cousin, an uncle, a neighbour, but men that were around you as a child at the early formative stages and years of your life. The first word is ego. The second word is frame. The third word is avatar. Number four is presence. And number five is human being. Now to understand what I'm saying, you have to go back. If you haven't watched or listened to the previous session, you have to go back and start from the previous session because it would make so much more sense as I move forward. But if the questions I have put forward, those 10 questions, I hope that when you answer the questions and perhaps when you reflected on the questions, you found that there was a through line what we call the regression line, a through line connecting those questions. But a picture came to mind as you answered those questions. And it was all about a male ego or a man's ego, a male frame or a man's frame, his presence, his avatar, and most importantly that we are simply human beings. Now, I, I, I start from that perspective today because depending on your upbringing, you know, one of the questions I asked was, was your father in your life at a young age? Were your parents married? Did you observe your father in the house making decisions? And who was responsible for the major decisions? All of those questions was to enable you um, disconnect from what is a natural process of, um, I guess, boxing in our fathers or the men in our lives um, into um, a box that sometimes is not very humane. Men are human beings and um, we have feelings, we have fears, we have doubts, we have hopes and dreams um, and we have emotions. The question I started with was 
to separate the man from the role, from the function, from the position of authority. And I was trying to get you to, I guess, look at in a three dimensional way of how one person, a human being, could be a father or a brother, but play the role of a protector, play the role of a provider, play the role of a priest, someone who teaches, but also play the role of someone who professes his love to you in whatever way. And I use the example of play. You know, did you play with your father at a young age, up to about age 18? Now, all men have egos. We have an ego need. And the questions I was asking was whether you were able to identify how your mother um, was able to satisfy some of his needs, um, his ego needs, and his sense of importance. Now, one of the words I talked about was presence. Wherever men are needed, wherever we are wanted, wherever we are praised, and wherever we are loved, you will always find our presence. In many ways, our manifested presence will congregate in the right location. Now, if we have made to feel as though we are not needed, not wanted, not loved, our presence is dispersed. So, in order to make your relationship in the future or presently work, you almost have to start with some basics. Um, do you recognize his presence? Can you feel his presence? I'm not talking about the physical touch, I'm talking about a almost a metaphysical um, exp expression. You know, we are spiritual beings, we live in a physical body. Yes, you can touch me physically, but can you feel his presence? When dad is not present, can you still feel his covering um, over you? Secondly, did you grow up with the sense of what a male frame should be? And I, I used in yesterday's session some questions to, to uncover what that looks like. I talked about a feminine frame and a masculine frame. And I talked about how most men, well, I should have, which I didn't, um, I should have talked about how most men who were born in the West post the 1960s um, have, 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 have lost the sense of the male frame, partly as a result of several societal factors. We don't have to go into each. But if you move out of the West and you move to the East or you move to other countries, you still see a sense of a, a masculine frame and a male presence. Connected with both is our ego. And, and therefore, what you find is that in order for your relationships to be successful, um, you need to have a, what I call a not necessarily a benchmark, but a soft landing. Uh, there has to have been a positive exposure at an early age that allows a foundation that can be built upon to ensure that you go into relationships not feeling as though you are independent but instead, making it obvious and communicating to the other person how much they are needed and how much you need them in the relationships. Now, the point of all of this is to say, every man is unique, but we are human beings. Uh, daughters and sons, uh, as we grow, uh, there's a tendency for us not to, I hate to use the word, there's a tendency for us not to humanize. As a matter of fact, we dehumanize our fathers um, and often our siblings, our brothers. Um, a father is someone who you know will always be there or was 
they have someone who was never there. And therefore, there isn't a face, there isn't a, a frame, there isn't an avatar, there isn't a sense of ego, there isn't a presence, and there is no human being. And that absence, by omission or by commission, is what is in your subconscious mind, and therefore, in all of your interactions, you were, you were controlled, your actions are dictated, your behavior is almost predictable, based on the images, the experiences that you have in your subconscious mind. And therefore, your results will always mirror some of this early conditioning that you have. Now, except, of course, changes are made. Um, I'll talk about some of that in, in the latter sessions. What, what I would hope you would take from um, uh, yesterday's session and what I'm trying to communicate today is the requirement for satisfying and for a successful relationship are very basic. Now there are nuances and there are subtle uh, um, deviations that are necessary, but more importantly, there are some adaptations that are needed as we journey through life. Uh, here is perhaps some guiding principle. Every man that you would meet is unique. Every man would like you to understand his uniqueness. Every man would like you to demonstrate that he is not the same with every other man. Despite your training and your background, your father and the way your father was loved, whilst the useful model is not the absolute model for your successful relationships, how does help you? Um, but if we go back to yesterday's session and what I have talked about thus far, I would hope that you would have identified three very, very simple observations. Now, I have discussed this at length in previous uh, sessions, and I talk about what a man needs on a very basic level. And I'm referring to men who are, obviously, of marriageable age, 18 and above. And I say sex, serenity, and servanthood. Now, from the questions yesterday, and our conversation so far today, what I would hope is that you can group all of the lessons into two of the three S's, serenity, servanthood. And I have said before that sex, though important for men, especially men of a certain age, um, is only one of the three basic needs of a man. But if there is adequate servanthood and a serene environment that you provide, that you create, it can do most of the heavy lifting in a successful relationship. So the questions I had put forward yesterday could be aggregated under two of the three basic requirements serenity and servanthood and i really don't know how to express or explain what serenity means uh, suffice it to say that it comes by your presence by your words by the aroma um, the fragrance uh, in the environment it comes by your thoughts and your prayers. Um, a house is a house is a house, but there are houses and there are homes. A lady is one who can take a house and convert it, make it into a home. A home is not the chairs and the accessories and the items of possessions. A home is filled with love. The ambience is peace. Um, you might say the coverings are serene. 
if you can understand how to provide a serene environment, which was part of the reason I used the questions I presented yesterday as a, as a starter for our conversation. And I asked you to go back and reflect. And I would guess that many of you, if you were to look back at your childhood, there'll be things that you could identify either in your family or in other families where you could, you could distinguish between a serene, a peaceful home and an agitated, a troublesome aroma in a different home. It could be your home, but there are times when I know as a young child, I would visit people's homes. And as I walked through the front door, there was a sense of peace, a serene environment. Um, an aroma of honour, and there will, there will be other places that I would go to and it would feel automatically as though there's been a battle or that there is an ongoing battle in the environment. Serenity, servitude. Now, servitude came through in some of the questions. Um, and how you serve is not just physically. Um, servanthood can come from the perspective of serving your purpose to um, your husband's purpose or your significant other's purpose or combining your vision with his um, but most importantly is the gift of servanthood servanthood is not a request it is not a demand um, it's a gift one person gifts to the other now this is perhaps where leadership and followership comes into play there is a huge mistake that we make with regards to leadership. People envy those who are called leaders, leaders and, 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 and we look up to leadership qualities as, um, as we should, um, as being very important. The mistake we make, however, is in society, we, we do not distinguish between where the, the power lies. Most people believe that the power lies in the leader. That is wrong, which is why in most relationships and those where women refuse to submit to their husbands, or rather wives <laughs> refuse to submit to their husbands, um, in those relationships, one of the things that um, stands out the most is that there is a confusion between where the power lies. Leaders do not choose their followers. Followers choose their leaders. A leader that goes or believes that they are important and walks and has no one following them is simply going for a walk alone. The followers are the ones who empower the leaders with power. They effectively, they, they trust you and they gift you um, their vision and ask for that vision gifted to you to be placed alongside or with your vision and therefore they transfer some form of authority to you for which you become responsible to and for them. You become responsible to and for them. So in today's session I would hope that from the questions from the previous one, serenity and servanthood is something you can start thinking about. Sex is something that comes much later. Now you may have observed intimacy, which was why I talked about the importance of observing affection being displayed between your parents or watching and seeing your parents play, sometimes watching and seeing them disagree but reconcile. All of those things are important because it shows intimacy and how it is gifted from one to the other and how it is received between both parties. Now we talk about giving so much. The mistake we make is we do not understand that the opposite aspect or side is receiving. Um, think about this. One of the great writers says, do not give pearls to swines, to pigs. The reason being pigs do not understand the value 
of pearls and diamonds and expensive ornaments. Therefore, the gift that is given has to be appreciated by the receiver before the gifting process is complete. Submission is a gift. The receiver, which is the leader, has to be able to appreciate what is being given to them in order for that gifting process to be complete. The same thing applies in relationships. If one person is perhaps um, unkind and the other person is very kind, you have a mismatch. And partly what we find in most people's experiences is a relationship between their parents that there was a mismatch. Now this brings me perhaps to what I would like to conclude today's session with or focus today's session on, which is communication. Communication um, is important in every relationship and sometimes it's not what you say, it's how you say it. Um, there is perhaps something for you. Timing, if there's something you can understand about relationships, timing is very important. The timing, um, how and when you say things. Put aside what you say. When you bring things to the surface is important. If I walk through the door, having worked for 10, 15 hours, and your reception is perhaps not welcoming, as I walk through, there's something in your heart that you must offload. That would be the wrong time. Now, if you go through the books of antiquities, what you will find is there's something about a man who, I mean, there's something about men, generally speaking, and something in us that really wants to share. So we will, we will share our most important secrets in our darkest moments with a woman that provides us with servitude and serenity. Um, so much so that men have to restrain themselves. We could talk about Samson. We can talk about all the people from, from old. Kings, noble men um, who shared too much because they felt comfortable about sharing. In most of the cases, the lady created an environment that was serene and she asked the right questions at the right time. So with regards to communication, timing should be, should be perhaps one of the first things that could make your relationship successful. Now, whether you are a man or a woman, there is a time for everything under the sun. A time to make peace and a time for battle. A time to praise and a time to hold back praise. A time to love and a time to be on your own. There is a time and a season for everything. The second, perhaps, recommendation is a principle. It's called the principle of good faith or the principle of peace. Um, in all of your interactions, your relationships, whether business or intimate or just friends casually, the good faith principle will always guide you into having better outcomes. It's a simple principle. It simply means in your interactions, always, without this exception, come to the interaction in good faith. Not bad faith. Don't prejudge. Don't presuppose. Don't draw conclusions. Come in good faith. Allow the person the opportunity to show you who they are or allow the person to val validate um, their position. Good faith. Which is why the, the, the writers say, um, if you go into a family, if you go into a nation, if you go into a place and they do not show you honour, you know, as you leave, it doesn't say start a war, 
start a flight. It says simply pick up your things and leave. But as you leave, you just shake the dust off your feet. Do not take their dishonor with you. Bad faith is a sign of dishonor. And so in your relationships and in your interactions, you have to learn how to come peaceably. Biblical reference, you have to come peaceably. In business, we call it good faith. So timing and good faith. That starts, I guess, what I would call um, the table of conversations. Because from that, you can build on anything. If you can communicate properly, um, the likelihood of a successful relationship is very high. If you cannot communicate and express yourself intelligently, if you cannot communicate in good faith, if you cannot time your communications and your interactions and even perhaps your disagreements carefully, you will always have issues. Now, let me conclude by talking about the negative. It's all well and good talking about positive things and you know, how to make things work. But I think most women will relate to this. Now, Assuming you have parents that were born prior to the 1960s, and particularly assuming you live in the West, there is a large possibility, there's a, a probability, not even a possibility, a probability that you have been perhaps conditioned uh, subconsciously to have a fear and aversion towards men. If you are black, um, there's a sense that there wasn't a father in the house because he was abusive and he was violent. Um, and you, you, you've gleaned on this from the group, from the community. The men um, were violent towards their wives from the early, early 60s and prior. And therefore you have to be independent and fend for yourself and not depend on a man. Now, that belief system applies even if you are not black, if you are Caucasian. Um, there's a feeling, especially the younger the woman is, that men have always been violent towards their wives. I don't believe that the historical accounts show an overwhelming truism to that statement, but I'll grant you, just like a broken clock, that maybe that there is a, a one-sixth chance that that is correct. Um, that two out of you know, a broken clock is right, let's say, twice every 24 hours. That's one twelfth. But let's just say half of that to be correct. Or perhaps I give you I give you both. So two out of 24 is you know, one twelfth. Let's say one twelfth of the time, which is 8.3%, call it 10%. That, that was the case. There were about 10% of men that were violent towards uh, their wives, their significant others. Now, recognize I'm talking about communication. And I'm going to give you some words which will form the conversation going forward in the next session. But I want you to marinate on these words uh, or these um, um, acronyms and let them guide you. Because they still have a play in today's society. I'll call the first part men and the second women. And let me just say, and let me speak on the, on the position that I'm talking to the 10%. The 10% who perhaps were, could have been better as role models, men and women. What we found is there was a strategy applied by men. You see, men are naturally disagreeable. And there were two behaviours. I call those behaviors AV. The first is anger and the second is violence. So there's a possibility that your archetype, your, your avatar for men, is men are angry and violent. And for that small group of men, they applied that communication style. It was a language whereby the man was always angry if he did not get his way and he would be violent by placing his hands on the woman. 
terrible behaviours, I should say. On the opposite side, we have another language for the women, which we call sign language. Um, shame, insult, guilt, and the need to be right. Now, around the 1960s, or prior to the 1960s, laws were put into place um, and we started to see men start to pivot and change. Firstly, you couldn't, women were given opportunities and rights, and therefore she wasn't beholden to what could be a prison. Um, and you couldn't be violent towards her, and you couldn't just be angry because she could leave. The welfare state was created in the West, and therefore women were emancipated. And what we saw was an, a disappearance of anger from men and a disappearance of violence. But what we saw was the introduction of the feminist movement began with the suffragettes. Fascinating if you've ever read the books. And as they tried to bring forward, and this is no criticism, this is just a historical truism, as they tried to bring forward their value system and their idea, ideas, they adopted uh, a principle and a behaviour which was similar to what men used to do because they had a need to be heard. It was anger and violence, which is why, if you go back and if you study the suffragettes and the feminist movement, there was a time in the United Kingdom when they were considered to be domestic terrorists. And whenever they did not get their way in, from the legal perspective, although anger, you can be as angry as you want. And in, in a world run by men, men just dismissed the anger. But they realized that by being violent, by staging protests, stopping, um, blocking up the streets, causing violence to people or to buildings or to property, private property, that they could get heard and they could get their message across. They realized after a number of years, it wasn't successful. Um, so they altered, they changed, they made subtle modifications. They left the AV language, which men pioneered anger and violence, and they, they kept some of the anger, but they adopted a different language. I call it sign, or it's called, I call it a sign, meaning anger, shame, insult, guilt, and the need to be right. Now, as, as we conclude today's session, here is a question for you. In your interactions with men, do you find that you display the following emotions? Anger. Do you use shaming language if you do not get your way? Or if you want to be heard, do you find that using pejoratives or insulting the person is something that comes instinctively? Um, ad hominems, uh, name calling. Do you find actually you may use a reference such as you're not as good as your father or you're just like your father or your grandfather was better than your father or your neighbor then, next door isn't it a great man? You're guilting the man in question by using a reference or a model to attack his ego to get him to do what you want him to do. And finally, the need to be right is where even in the, in the, in the presence of overwhelming evidence, logic, data, statistics, information, that you allow your feelings to override what is a logical conclusion. You will not give up on that feeling. It's just feelings based. Now, the reason I have asked you whether you exhibit any of these is to draw your attention back to the questions I had asked. If you had the mother, did you see any of these emotions and behaviors being demonstrated? If so, there's a huge tendency that perhaps you adopted or you modeled subconsciously those tendencies. Now, if you did not have a mother that ex exhibited such behaviours, as you grew up, have you found that you display the same communication language? A sign, anger, shame, insult, guilt, and the need to be right. Now, if the answer is yes, then it's possible that you bought into the feminist ideology.
by implicit digestion or explicit you know digestion it doesn't matter how but you bought into it now this will form the basis of what we we discuss going forward in the next session but the point of the communication language is as follows if you do not come in good faith and if you do not come peaceably it doesn't matter how matter how great the man might be there will always be a reason why the relationship fails number two if the man is terrible as you believe he is remember to the person with the hammer everything looks like a nail assuming he is as evil as you think he is i have found from my experience that the best way is to wash the person with love with peace with hope recognizing that they are broken you don't drop to the level of the same person by matching their brokenness to make a point if you find that in your interactions it's very easy for you to go from anger to shame or insult and it's something you you find yourself um, you, you find it regretful in your quiet time then it means your communication language and your communication cues and your subconscious communication model has an ideology that needs to be revamped you have to displace what is a communication behavior with something that is more peaceful again i'll leave you with the two things i shared previously good faith or peaceable interaction or engagement and timing now i hope that has been useful